What's up, everyone? Welcome to the What Is Crypto podcast with your boy, Nye. My name is Matthew Aaron, and I'm the producer of the show. Today, we're talking to Bitcoin Joel Burge. And in this show, we have a little bit of everything. Not only crypto, we have a guy who has been in and out of business, starting companies from the bottom to the top, now he here. And we get to pick his brain, Nye gets to talk to him, we get to listen to somebody who's very well-spoken, very well-educated and experienced in the space of cryptocurrency, blockchain, and business in general. I'm excited to get into this conversation, but before we do, make sure you're subscribed, leave us a rating and a comment, and go over to our Facebook page, sign up, so that when Bitcoin starts bulling, you have a place that you can talk to people, figure out which coins are the best, and how not to FOMO and how to hodl. We'll see you after the show. All right, my man, I'm glad to have you on the show today. Can you just share what is your full name and title? My first name, uh, or at least my birthing name, was uh, Bitcoin, last name Birch. Uh, so that's uh, B-I-T-C-O-I-N. Birch is B-I-R-C-H. But some of my friends call me Joel, J-O-E-L. And thanks for having me. And how would you describe yourself? I'm a five foot ten uh, white male. I weigh about 167 <laughs> pounds of raw steel and sex appeal, baby. And I would, I would definitely describe myself as a free thinker and someone who is, you know, very optimistic, confident, and I would say loyal if I was just using some, uh, some quick adjectives. I'm a homie and I, and I love my homies. I can confirm Birch is a homie. I'm a homie. Let's get into the meat of it, man. Love me. So it's the same, bro. Same. <laughs> Big meat eater. So. God damn it. <laughs> so, you know, we've had multiple conversations on this, actually, like ourselves, you and I, and I think it's a, an interesting conversation, especially when you get into the realm of crypto Twitter and all the things that go on in the social scene, specifically for crypto and, and even outside of crypto. But how would you define an influencer versus like an advocate? I don't particularly like the term influencer. I think I, I define it very literally, right? An influencer is someone who has some level of influence and you can, it's almost like a celebrity, right? Like I don't like, at what point do you define celebrity? Dwayne The Rock Johnson is a celebrity, but there's also people who would be considered celebrities that neither you or I have ever heard of. So uh, influencers have scales, right? There's smaller influencers, uh, you know, maybe someone with 40, 50,000 followers in the grand scheme of social today. And then you have like mega influencers, you know, so an influencer is someone who has influence and who uses their message to influence their opinion on other people. And an advocate is someone who doesn't necessarily need to, you know, record their life or share it publicly, but still goes to the conferences or still tells all their friends and families about it or still uh, works on open source code, uh, you know, on nights and weekends, and maybe doesn't use social media or doesn't have more than 600 followers or something. And, and they really push the space forward. And in, in my opinion, influencers are uh, a little bit more, um, you know, pushing out. And uh, that's kind of how I would define them. Why is like, why is all this stuff important, man? You know, specifically the, the advocation of Bitcoin, like what's important about getting just talking about it and advocating for it? Yeah, well, at its core, at its most intrinsic level, this goes back to my statement about how lucky we are to be in the West and traveling the world and the lessons I've learned is that I don't have any issue paying for coffee with my debit card. I, in fact, I use Apple Pay and it takes three seconds and it's safe and it's and it's instant and that problem doesn't need to be fixed for me. But I make up a very small percentage of the 7 billion people on earth, over half of which struggle for clean drinking water, let alone a strong monetary policy or financial system. Um, and when you start to understand some of the issues that have unfolded in places across the world where their core currency has lost all of its value, you start to understand the problem with the core financial system as it exists today. And so you understand that cryptographically secured assets like Bitcoin that are managed, for lack of a better term, via a public ledger is the safest and most fair way to distribute money at scale. You know, we, we haven't needed to solve these problems at scale for the last 2,000 years because the world is so fragmented. It didn't matter. But the world isn't, because again, going back to the Web 3.0 points, the world's no longer fragmented. 
It's very, very well interconnected, and we're starting to see so many inefficiencies. So at its core, that's what Bitcoin helps, but I do want to differentiate. I do think there's a different use case for the majority of cryptocurrencies, and, and that may be a different conversation. Now let's touch on that. I'm interested in that. Tell me, tell me a little bit more about that thought process. I hate that most tokens are referred to as cryptocurrencies because the vast majority of them were not designed to be currencies at all. They're just cryptographically secured utility tokens, or at least they attempt to be. Most in reality are cryptographically secured securities tokens. And the sooner we embrace that, the better. I think that it's very important, again, back to this fragmented uh, world becoming now interconnected over this last decade, and it's going to increase a hundredfold in the next decade. Um, with the democratization of data and, and information and people uh, and money, the ability for more people, retail investors, to invest in the companies of our future, to invest in startups, to make their money work for them is getting easier and easier by the day. 10 years ago, if you were not like an accredited investor on Wall Street, investing in stocks just was a foreign concept to you. And now look how many millions of retail investors use the Robinhood and Wealthfront apps to buy funds and portfolios and things like that. So the point I'm making is that's only going to continue to increase the democratization of finance and investing. And the vast majority of these cryptographically secured securities tokens and utility tokens uh, are essentially, uh, to they're just tokenized securities and they allow retail people at a completely global scale, not just in Silicon Valley, not just in the United States, but at a global scale to be angel investors and to invest in different startups. And it's a really effective way to fundraise um, for these particular startups. And that's really the main use case. And, there, and it's time that we embrace that. There's really nothing wrong with that, in my opinion. This is a better way to fundraise for the vast majority of the technologies in this space agreed and i think that like the fact of the matter is in 2017 so many people got burnt and even into 2018 so many companies raised 40 50 million dollars that it's kind of put a sour taste in people's mouths to discuss icos and things like that and even now what we're seeing is the sec and the cftc and all these regulatory entities really coming down heavy upon people that raised all this money in the past. Do you think that this is going to completely halt or stop the potential of utilizing this current, this brand new method as, as the fundraising method like you're talking about? No, but it definitely changes the landscape and rightfully so. Most people don't know that like 90% of the projects that get listed on a website like Kickstarter, uh, Kickstarter is my analogy for utility tokens. Because on Kickstarter, you're not investing in a company, you're just pre-purchasing a product, but it is funding the company, right? That's exactly the same as an ICO utility zone. It's the exact same thing. But 90% of those Kickstarter projects go unfunded. 90% of ICOs went funded because people were greedy and ignorant. So we got to fix that. And, and around Kickstarter, there are rules, there are regs, there is internal, you know, that will continue to, to evolve. So what's going to happen is people will still have ICOs, but because the not everyone will be able to follow the rules and, and some of them will just be generally bad ideas, I think they'll struggle to raise money and that'll be a good thing. It'll make it a more competitive market. It'll ensure that the more high quality utility tokens are being um, being bought. Uh, and then on the other side, you have Seed Invest. And Seed Invest is the analogy for securities tokens. It's a crowdfunding website where you can buy, and this is not sponsored by Kickstarter Seed Invest, disclaimer, <laughs> um, where you can buy equity in startups. 90% of, uh, of the startups listed on Seed Invest don't ever get funding either, but it's easy for, for retail investors to buy equity uh, or pre-purchase products on the internet today. Cryptocurrency makes that easier. So it will change. The landscape will continue to mature, but it won't completely be stifled or killed. I think it'll only get higher quality. What time frame are we looking at for this, man? You know, we've seen, I don't know, it's been two years almost since the the ICO really boom happened and things like that. And we're starting to see some heavy regulations coming in just now. Uh, what, what you think of time-wise for something like this? I mean, it's going to be another two years at least, really, before there's any serious regulation considered. You And what people also fail to understand when they consider regulation is that the only thing the SEC has given a shit about regulating is the ICO market because they're unlawful security sales. And so the ICO landscape has begun to be it's basically regulated at this point, um, and it's regulated in the sense that these ICOs have to follow traditional rules. Uh, it's just they're just fitting inside the existing system, uh, and the CFTC loosely explores Bitcoin futures, which are legally traded. So, really, all we're waiting on is 
general kind of policy on the overall cryptocurrency sector as it exists as a financial sector. And the, and the truth of the matter is the government largely has come out and said they don't care because it's just not relevant. It's $250 billion, man. The, the derivatives market is five quadrillion dollars. Uh, the, the stock market is many trillions of dollars. Like it's just a blip on the radar. And until it's much, much larger until way more companies tokenize their securities or their or their equity holdings. Um, it, it won't be that big of a priority. But that doesn't mean it, it's not still a huge market, right? Forex isn't bigger than the traditional equities market, but it's still big enough for, the, for there to be many companies thriving within that ecosystem and many investors thriving in that ecosystem. So cryptocurrency doesn't have to replace the entire world economic system um, to be a really relevant part of the financial ecosystem. Bars. I love that, man. Bars. Serious, some serious bars, bro. <laughs> yeah. This question, how do you use crypto in your daily life, is sponsored by BMAG. BMAG.io. BMAG, they write stories that inform influence and inspire the global blockchain cryptocurrency community how i use crypto in my daily life varies i guess from day to day but there's two primary uses for me outside of just hodling as a speculative long-term investor and one is to actually pay some of my remote contributors who prefer to get paid uh, in cryptocurrency as opposed to using TransferWise or PayPal or um, some type of other wire transfer. You know, I have a fairly robust uh, team that is largely remote that works from all different corners of the world. And I have several members of that team who uh, we pay in crypto. And of course, uh, it's reported in much the same way as paying in any other denomination. It's not particularly complicated from a tax perspective, uh, but it sure is a lot easier than paying a $30 transfer fee to send money over to Ukraine or Amsterdam or wherever. And so being able to have the freedom to pay uh, across borders without really any middleman um, is kind of the cornerstone of what crypto was built on top of and it's something that I am able to do all the time. I'm able to um, remove those barriers and hire people uh, that are extremely talented in places outside of, of my own ecosystem that is the US or Chicago. But then also as a actual you know, merchant, I accept cryptocurrency as a form of payment. Um, and it's very robust and easy to do. It's almost instantaneous when people make payments via crypto. They're able to instantly gain access to my products. And I'm able to instantly transfer that cryptocurrency uh, into another account. Uh, I'm able to, again, report on it for tax purposes uh, and income purposes. And um, it's, it's extremely convenient and offers me as a merchant a new way to accept payment beyond PayPal and credit card. And I don't have to pay a 3% fee every single time someone uh, signs up for something. And so I, I use cryptocurrency as both a merchant and as an employer uh, to, to both pay and, and receive. So it's something that I interact with on my day to day, uh, every single day, just about. And it really gives me uh, a lot of optimism for, for where that infrastructure can really go and how it can evolve. And now back to Michael and his guest. Enjoy the rest of the show. And all right, I want to dive into a little bit about you personally, because beyond all the information that you just spewed at us, and, and uh, uh, while it's quality information, the really interesting part is you, bro. Uh, you've done many different successful things in and outside of the crypto space, but inside you've got Bravado, uh, which is a huge, huge uh, educational, informational trading community. Uh, you could probably explain it better than I have. I know you're working on some really cool new stuff that I'm still not 100% familiar with. So lay it on me, bro. Yeah, oh, I appreciate the platform and I'll try to keep it keep it concise. But essentially, prior to starting to take cryptocurrency seriously, uh, which began in 2015, prior to that, I had made a career um, out of basically being a salesperson at, at different levels, um, but also kind of an entrepreneur, just basically always had different ideas that I was working on, startups, 
and uh, eventually my love for startups, my love for having side businesses. And I, I did quite well uh, in some internet ventures and affiliate marketing and things like that in my early 20s. But uh, it led me to Grubhub. Grubhub went on to become a $15 billion startup when I joined them. Uh, I was a very small, uh, fairly localized startup, and they hired me to really build out their sales program from a, from a training perspective. How do we sell this product to restaurants, et cetera? And I oversaw that for uh, the better part of five years. And um, we had a lot of success and the bug hit me again, right? Like, this is great. I was really impactful with building a, you know, portion of a startup that went on to be really successful, but I want, I want to get back in the driver's seat. And so I left my career uh, about two years ago and I started working on um, making my impact in the cryptocurrency ecosystem as an entrepreneur. Uh, And I did that in two ways. One, I wanted to educate people about crypto. So gave away hundreds of hours of free content I paid to have created. And then I created myself over the course of several years, tens of millions of impressions. And we started Lunar Capital. Uh, This was my attempt to help rich people invest in crypto. (laughs) Basically, if you're an accredited investor, you have money you want to throw around, Lunar Capital manages it for you, um, registered fully with the uh, appropriate authorities and everything like that. It's just our opportunity to kind of play around and help some investors get some additional exposure. But my true passion, man, is Lunar uh, along the same brand. Lunar is just an automated investing platform that I've been building for the last 18 months. Really, since I quit my job, I've, I've made it a focus in one way, shape, or another. And what we're doing, dude, is, is, is we're building a product finally that's geared towards the 80 to 90% of people who are listening to this podcast who are currently holding cryptocurrency on an exchange, who haven't logged in in a month or longer and are completely inactive. Um, So many products is just for traders and traders is such a niche fragmented portion of an already niche market. And frankly, most traders lose no matter what products they purchase. So at the end of the day, I wanted to build a a platform that allowed people to take back control of their portfolio, um, invest it uh, in different indexes that are designed by experts, um, and have that portfolio managed, rebalanced, et cetera, over time. Um, and so that's my real passion project. That's where I feel like I can really help the most people. I love it. And that kind of leads into the, the the final kind of parts of our conversation here, which revolve around like entrepreneurship, you know, because not only is crypto really cool for trading and doing all these things, but I think what you've specifically showcased is in an emerging market, there's also going to be emerging potential and possibilities uh, to start companies and things like that. Tell the people a little bit about like what, like what does that mean to you? Well, listen, being an entrepreneur is cool right now. It's been cool for a little while because Instagram makes it look really cool. But <laughs> I used to put a lot, I, I joke cause like if you look at my Instagram feed back in, before I quit my job, it was lit. It was lit. Traveling the world, motivational quotes, all that kind of shit. And I was really doing those things, but like I had a job. And look at my Instagram feed since I quit my job. And there's like seven pictures over the last two years. Uh, and I'm never on that platform. That's because I'm actually an entrepreneur and I'm not an Instagram one. And I just don't have time for it. And outside of Twitter, uh, where I can just shit talk my thoughts, I don't have time for the production that goes into doing Instagram and and that sort of stuff. Uh, I say all that because my point is entrepreneurship is very sexy, but in reality, it's not for most people. Um, I think, however, that cryptocurrency is a unique opportunity for you to give something a shot. And I believe that if you're on Instagram and you feel motivated to become an entrepreneur, then shit, man, go try it. Try to do it for real. Try to come up with a problem that you can solve and then go and try and solve it. But I spent a decade while I worked my different jobs putting 30 and 40 plus hours a week into different side hustles. I attempted to solve mobile payments at bars. I attempted to solve, um, I attempted to basically build machine learning into sales hiring, um, among other things. I attempted to fix local discovery for bars and nightclubs. I attempted to solve different problems, failed at different levels for a variety of different reasons, but I at least attempted it. What I learned in those failures is that well, I keep coming back because I just really have a knack for trying to do this kind of stuff, solve problems um, at scale. I love it and I love the hustle and I don't mind sitting in my house by myself for 14 hours a day on my computer. Um, Crypto gives people an opportunity to try it. But if you realize quickly it's not for you and you're better off with your 40 hour a week job that you're somewhat passionate about and then having some lemonade stand on the weekends, like that's cool too. If someone wants to be an entrepreneur, 
and they like maybe have a couple ideas or or things that they haven't really executed on but they've been thinking about executing on can you just share like give like one or two pieces of really solid advice for someone who's like like into it really believes that they can do it but just hasn't taken that leap yet what the, what should they do first thing you have to do is write down all the reasons you haven't moved forward you know i could give i could sit here and give you some like impractical advice that i saw on an instagram caption or read in a book like you just got to start and that kind of stuff. But the reality is it's not that freaking, it's just not that easy, man. And uh, as you know, so what I found to be helpful for me when I've gotten in ruts and I've gotten in many ruts, um, that's what it's about, right? It's about going through ups and downs. I sit down and I write down all the reasons that I'm not able to move this particular thing forward. And, and, it, and a reason could be that you're a lazy piece of shit. And another reason could also, could be that you don't know how to build websites. And so you have to write down you know, well, I don't have a developer to build the idea, uh, or I don't know the first thing about fundraiser or whatever. And you have to write down the things that, that are getting in your way, because that's going to allow you to visualize the holes that you need to fill. And that leads into my second piece of advice, fill the holes that you can fill. For me, I saw on my list in order to attract people to this product and gain some traction. Um, I need a good like sales page. I need a good website that like sells it, right? That was one of my and so this was like seven, eight years ago. I spent 18 months teaching myself to code. And then I built my own sales page because I couldn't afford a developer. You may see that on your list and say, I think I could probably figure out how to build a website too and go my route. Or you might see that and say, there's no chance. I could never figure out how to build a website. I have no interest in that. And you need to circle that, uh, that particular roadblock because all the, all the different roadblocks that you circle are the gaps that you need to fill and you go and find people to fill them. And so the second piece of advice is find people that are way smarter than you. And if you can't afford them, you have to sell them on why they should give up some of their free time to help you move the needle. And you're going to have to pay for it in terms of equity or whatever. But if there's gaps that you can't fill on your own as an entrepreneur, you need to go, and Joel, where do I find these guys? You go onto the internet. Uh, there's a website, it's sick. It's called Google. And you type into that magic search box, entrepreneur meetup in Kansas City, where I live or wherever you live, right? And you go and find people. You go onto the internet and you find people and you email people and you go on LinkedIn and you DM people. Bro, when I was 19 years old, I was emailing everyone who I thought even knew a software developer so I could meet one guy who I could then pitch for two weeks on why he needs to spend 10 hours a week building my software for free. So first piece of advice, write down your roadblocks. You just have to visualize them. And then the second piece of advice is tackle those roadblocks by surrounding yourself with people who are better than you. Does that answer? Is that, that answers it, bro. Is that kosher? It's super kosher. I love it, my man. All right, bro. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate you taking the time. My guy, I appreciate you having me. Thanks so much. And uh, take care. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of the What is Crypto podcast, Bitcoin, Joel Burge, thank you very much for coming on the show. What a nice guy. And your DYOR for this episode, actually, I just want you to do one thing. I want you to make your portfolio. If you haven't downloaded a couple apps, then you're missing out on the whole crypto experience. Make sure you have CoinMarketCap, Blackfolio, both apps in your phone. There you can put in your holdings. Whatever shitcoin, whatever how much Bitcoin you have, you can put it in there and keep track of your prices. You can keep track of what's happening in the crypto space. So download those two apps, CoinMarketCap, Blackfolio. Make sure you're keeping track of your crypto portfolio because who knows what's going to happen with the price, with crypto, or the future of blockchain. I'm excited. And we'll see you in future episodes of the What is Crypto podcast with your boy, Nye.